The problem of divorce is a massive one. Over the last 50 years, divorces have gone up 700%. One out of every two couples now gets divorced. 50% of all marriages end in divorce. Those are some high statistics. By the year 2000, half of all the American children will have not been raised in a traditional home. And in the minority community, we've already passed that statistic. This has all been exacerbated and made worse by a court allowance of divorce called no-fault divorce. Divorce is always somebody's fault. <laughs> but no-fault is the way for the legislature to not have to worry about it. So both of you agree to the terms. Both of you agree to how the property is to be divided. They say, we don't need a headache. Pay your lawyer $90, file the papers, divorce granted, no questions asked. And so we are in a day when divorce is easy. So commitment is not necessarily that important. Well, I'm going to give you what the Bible says. Before we can talk about divorce and remarriage, we need to talk about marriage. What you're getting divorced out of. I would like to submit that what I share today becomes the foundation for everything I'm going to share over the next three weeks. And so your understanding of today is critical for your own life, for your own family, and for what you tell your buddies. Because a lot of this mess is being stimulated by what you think your buddy ought to do and the advice you give them. We will look at two passages, Malachi chapter 2 and Genesis chapter 1 and 2. So turn to Malachi and hold your finger in Genesis. Malachi is our issue at hand. Genesis is our illustration. So Malachi will give the data. Genesis will give the illustration. Please note verse 13 of Malachi 2. And this is another thing you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears with weeping and with groaning. A lot of serious worship going on. Because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. Yet you say, how come? For what reason? Because the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth against whom you have dealt treacherously Though she is your companion and your wife by what? Covenant. Everything I say today and the next three weeks wrap around your understanding of one little itsy bitsy Hebrew Old Testament word, covenant. It is your ability to understand that or your inability to accept it that will govern your life from here on out. Before I get started, if you want to leave now, <laughs> and I, that sounds humorous, but I'm halfway serious, because once you learn it, God holds you accountable to it. But even leaving won't help because if you could have learned it and didn't learn it, God will judge you for it. So actually, you're in trouble both ways already. He says, she is your wife 
by covenant. Before we can talk marriage, we must talk covenant. What is a covenant? All of us in this room have entered into contracts before. A contract is an agreement between two parties about a certain issue in which stipulations are given, agreement is reached, ratification of the document, both parties sign, and then you become legally bound to the stipulations of the contract. That's a contract. A covenant includes a contract, but it is more than a contract. What makes a covenant more than a contract is that it is tied to relationship, not just to the formal issue. You don't need a relationship to do business. I don't have to like you to sign a contract. I just have to like the deal. But in a covenant, it's more than how we relate to this thing, contract. It is also how we relate to the persons involved in the contract, which kicks it up and makes it a covenant. So a covenant is a contractual arrangement between two parties or two groups that are tied together by virtue of arrangements and relationships. The Bible has three covenantal institutions. That is, institutions that God created to carry out his contractual arrangement with this planet. Covenant number one, family. What we're going to talk about today, so I won't spend time there, but family. Covenant number two, church. His redeemed people. He has an agreement with them. It's called the new covenant, where he makes an arrangement with them based on the relationship that through them, he is going to express his concern in the world. Three, government. The government is the third covenantal institution through which God operates the world organizationally. And so he bears a relationship to all three of those, and that's why the Bible says even the governor and the president, Romans 13, is a minister of God. Okay? Now, let's go back to the first covenant. The first covenant is marriage and family. Why did God create marriage? There are three reasons why God created marriage. And only one of them have anything to do with you being happy. Okay? There are three reasons God created marriage. One of them has to do with making you happy, but the other two don't have anything to do with you directly. Let me go through to them. The first reason God created marriage is procreation, having babies. Now, this is a whole nother sermon, and I don't have time to go into it, so let me just summarize it, because it's critical. Okay? The Bible makes grand statements about having babies. In fact, the Bible says the more the merrier. Keep on having them. Okay? But why? Why the big deal about having kids? Remember God told Adam and Eve in Genesis, be fruitful and multiply so that you will have dominion over the earth. The reason why God wanted married couples to make babies wasn't just so that they could have people who look like them running around the house. <laughs> that wasn't it. It had to do with the theology of dominion. Dominion meant reproduce yourself and spread out all over this planet so that all over this planet there will be somebody ruling every area of the globe under my rulership. 
In other words, babies are the way to make sure the name of God gets perpetuated throughout the whole earth. See, I'm to raise my kids so that whether one moves to Baltimore or one moves to, to L.A. or one moves to New York, when they disseminate and leave my house, the mark of God relocates in New York, in Los Angeles, and in Baltimore. That God is disseminated worldwide. That was the purpose of having babies. It was so that there would be divine dominion. God's rule everywhere through the babies that were disseminated everywhere. And so the Bible says, blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. So, honey, you ready to go one more round? <laughs> I didn't hear an amen. <laughs> See, it is the perpetuation of the divine name. Now, most of us have babies that carry our name. God says, have babies to carry my name everywhere. Secondly, is self-realization. Now, that's the happy part. He told Adam, he says, I will make a helpmate for you. That was another way of saying, boy, you need help. <laughs> you are incomplete when it is time to marry and you don't. As long as you're supposed to be single, God is your completeness. When it is time for marriage, that means God is now bringing somebody along to fix up the rest of you that's lacking. The reason that Adam was given a wife was to complete the lack. The reason why God gives you to make, he doesn't give you somebody just like you. For if both of you were the same, one of you would be unnecessary. He gives someone who is different than you to make up the difference. So that you can fulfill the complete purpose of life as God has ordained it. So self-realization, the realization of all God created you to be at the point that he calls you for marriage. Self-realization. Finally, the third purpose of marriage is divine illustration. You are a type of Christ and the church. The Bible says the church is the bride, Christ is the bridegroom. In a marriage, the husband is the bridegroom and the wife is the bride. And so you are to illustrate a greater reality, and that is the reality of God to his people. And so a bad marriage means a bad illustration. Because an illustration is supposed to do one thing, illustrate. And so when you get divorced, you're saying something very bad about God. Now, when God wanted to form marriage, he established an agreement between a man and a woman in which they would covenant under him this contractual relationship that we call marriage. And it's at this point, if you haven't buckled up your seatbelt, you need to. Because at this point, we want to break down the ingredients of a marriage covenant. I've told you what a covenant is. I've told you what the purpose of marriage is. So now let's look at the marriage covenant. We'll look at it in principle in Malachi 2 and then in illustration in Genesis one and two. Principle number one about the ingredients of a marriage covenant. The first thing you need to know, and the most important, it is a legal relationship established by God. It is a legal relationship. Please note, he says in verse 14, for what reason? Because the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth. The Lord has been a witness. We do not have to take a lot of time, I'm sure, to prove to you that marriage is God's idea. 
God told Adam, I will make a mate suitable for you. It's all his idea. Therefore, it is a divine covenant. Not a human covenant. Not only is it God's idea, it's God's legal idea. Notice he says he has been a witness against you. The Hebrew word for witness means a legal accuser. He has legally seen what you have done and taken the stand against you. He has entered the heavenly courtroom and is rendering a verdict against you because you are divorcing your mate. Now, that's why when people tell me, you know, well, Pastor, I don't see why we have to go through this, a ceremony. I don't, a piece of paper doesn't mean anything. Oh, no, 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 no. That's not it. It's already legal in heaven, so you shouldn't have a problem of making it legal on earth. It's a legal declaration. He is a witness. And the reason you know it was legal is because when they got a divorce, they had to get a bill of divorcement. Just couldn't walk away. You got a bill of divorcement. You had a piece of paper. Okay, so paper did have something to do with it. And it was legal. A legal declaration of a relationship because a covenant includes legality. Now, Grab onto your neighbor for this one. This is a rough one coming next. Because marriage is a divine covenant and not a human covenant, only God can break the covenant. That explains Jesus' statement in Matthew 6, what God has joined together. Let no what? Man put asunder. Why? Because it's not man's covenant. And you can't let a man overrule a divine covenant. And even people know it's a divine covenant. So they recognize God has something to do with this. Well, he has a, more to do with this than you will care to want to know. He says, at the moment you and your mate say, I do, stamped in heaven, legally certified marriage. Five years later, you don't go to judge God for the divorce. You go downtown. And you say, Mr. Judge, we have agreed. We can't live together anymore. Both of us have signed on a dotted line, divided the property, and therefore we wish a divorce. The judge says, man, judge is a man, divorce granted. Got a problem. The man gave you a divorce from a divine covenant. And you can't do that. So God sees the judge say, divorce granted. God picks up his pad and says, divorce not granted. So God doesn't grant the divorce, at least a no-fault divorce. We'll go into what kind of divorces he does grant, and he does grant some. Once God stamps no divorce, that is, it's, it's a non-covenantal based divorce. It's one only man gave you. God holds the position you're still married. Which explains what Jesus meant when he said that if a man puts away his wife, goes and marries another woman, he is now committing adultery. And the reason it's adultery is because God still sees the first marriage as valid because it's a divine covenant and only he can break divine covenants. Men can't break divine covenants. So here's what we want. We want God to marry us, but men to separate us. Come on now. God to bless the marriage, but God not to bless the divorce. And God says, if I bless the marriage, the only way you can get out of it is if I bless the divorce. So if I don't bless the divorce, you're still married. If you're still married, you're in adultery. Adult, the, the penalty for adultery is death. Therefore, anybody living in adultery dies. I told you. I, I told you. You say, wait a minute, but I'm still alive. Not necessarily. As you'll see in a moment. Covenantal death precedes physical death. So what I'm saying to this point is this. 
Marriage is a divine covenant. If you came together with a recognition that God had something to do with this, that means that you entered a covenant with God. And when you go to the divorce court and a man breaks the covenant, God says unacceptable. It's acceptable for society. It's not acceptable for God. Number one, marriage is a legal relationship established by God, and therefore only God can break it. You have to understand that. Only God can break it. Now, some of you are wondering, well, yeah, but for what can I get it broken for? Because some of you are getting worried. So don't worry about it. Because I know for many of you, this is the first time you're hearing this. And how do you get dead people alive? You have to resurrect them. So if you've had covenantal death, you need covenantal resurrection. And we'll explain what covenantal res resurrection is if you have died covenantally. Okay? Divorce is breaking covenant. Marriage is entering into covenant. Point two, principle two, which ties into principle one. It functions under authority. There is always a hierarchy in how covenants operate under authority. Let me quote to you 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It says, God is over Christ. Christ is over every man. The man is over the woman. He gives a hierarchy. Everybody's under somebody. That's what, he, that's what hierarchy means. Submission on some level. In marriage, catch this, both parties are under God, and the woman is to submit to the leadership of the man. Hierarchy. Children are submit to the authority of parents. And where you don't have authority, you have chaos. So covenants always include authority. Now, if God is the ultimate authority in a marriage, and he is, because it's a divine institution, if God is the ultimate authority, he calls the shots. That's what bosses do. He calls the shots. Now, he says, do you want to end in my covenant marriage? The man says, yes, I do. The woman says, yes, I do. So the next question God wants to know is, do you agree to operate covenantally in the marriage and the marriage doesn't occur unless you say, I do? You say, wait a minute, I don't remember agreeing to no covenant. Oh, yes, you did. Because uh, I think the preacher said something like, do you promise to love, honor, cherish, in sickness and in health? for richer or poorer, for better or worse, you made a covenantal agreement because he ended the statement with, so help you God, or in accordance with God's word. Come on and think back. Can you remember that? <laughs> All right. What you did, see, you weren't thinking about God. You were looking into her eyes, and she was looking into your eyes. You said, yeah, I do anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you weren't thinking about God. Tough. God was thinking about the covenant. See, God knows that you have honeymoon in your eyes. God's got covenant in his. And God is thinking agreement stamped, ratified. That's it. You've already signed and you can't go back and erase. I didn't know what I was saying at the church. <laughs> can't do that. Covenant ratified by God in heaven, settled. Yay and amen. That's it. And now he says, my authority. So as you exit the church, God leaves with you to become the authority over the relationship. Now, the tragedy is most relationships, when they get in trouble, never consult the authority. And so what they consult is the judge who has nothing to do with this marriage, he wasn't there when you got married, don't know what you said to one another, have nothing to do with it, he's just the quickest person in town who's been given legal authority to do something God never authorized him to do. Except in certain situations, which we'll talk about. It functions under authority. So, you must understand that when you get married, it's not just what you and your wife want. It's what God tells you and your wife you can have or not have. 
Thirdly, this is a heavy one now. Covenants are only entered under the penalty of death. In other words, when you break any covenant of God, you die immediately. I mean, on the spot death. Now, you say, wait a minute. Hold it. I have gotten divorced. I am not dead. Oh, yes, you are. Most certainly. It's called covenantal death. You die. Let me illustrate what I mean. Oh, you think in Malachi, turn back to Genesis. Now, you're going to need your Bible for this series. Genesis. Chapter 2. Verse 16, and the Lord God commanded man, saying, from any tree of the garden you may eat freely. But from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day you eat from it, you shall surely die. When was he going to die? The day he ate from it. Did he drop dead the day he ate from the tree? Not most certainly. No. What happened the day he ate from the tree? He was excommunicated out of the garden. That's what happened. He was removed from the presence and the fellowship of God. That's what happened. Guess what happened when he was excommunicated? His world crumbled. He didn't die, or he did die, but that was long-term death. That was immediate death for this day. Not tomorrow, not the day after tomorrow. You break covenant, bang, death, immediately. Because what's the definition of death? Remember this. Death is separation. That's what death is. You never are non-extinct once you're born. Even when you die, you go to heaven or hell. Death is separation. When you break covenant with God, you are immediately separated from him. And when you are immediately separated from him, that's death. With death comes demise. If you are covenantally dead... There is no person you can talk to, no place you can go to get covenantal life other than the author of the covenant. There's no place you can go. You are in trouble. So what happened when Adam got kicked out? He and his wife fought, had to work eight hours a day by the sweat of his brows. Every time men you sweat at work, think of Adam. What happened with the woman? L listen to this, ladies. When he was covenantally dead, look, two things happened. Number one, pain in childbirth. But number two, a very interesting statement, says your desire shall be for your husband. What does that mean? It means you're going to pain for him. You're going to want him. You're going to need him. And he more often than not will not be there for you. Any of you relate to that? You need your husband to understand. He just doesn't seem to understand. You need him to stand with you. He just doesn't seem to stand with you. You need him to support you. He just doesn't seem to support you. You have a desire for it, but it just never seems to come. You can never get this guy to turn around. Why? Because he's dead. And the relationship is dead. That's why. And death means that there is no life. Nothing gets this thing cooking again. And that's why when you're covenantally dead, life falls apart no matter how much money you make. When your covenant's broken. If you belong to Jesus Christ and have entered into covenant with God and break covenant by divorce, God removes his hands of protective blessing from you and life demises around you. Doesn't matter who you marry next. It's covenantal death. Romans 7 says that a wife is bound to her husband for as long as her husband lives. But when her husband dies, she is no longer bound, but she is free to marry another. As long as the covenant is at work, in spiritual life or in physical life, you are bound to the covenant. 
when the covenant dies because the mate dies physically or when the covenant dies because God kills the covenant spiritually because there's a biblical basis for the divorce, then you're no longer bound. You are now free to remarry. So the issue is, is it a biblically based divorce? Now I get in all kind of trouble and let me preface my statement here that I'm not talking about any particular couple in this statement. But I get in a lot of trouble because I get people mad at me because I have to ask them questions when they come for counseling about marriage. And one person gets got really ticked off at me, you know, who's not here now, but they just got really ticked off at me. Why you got to know all that? All you need to know is I want to get married. No, no, because I don't want to help kill you. I don't help you. I don't help you die. Because once you break covenant, God kills you. Bang, it's over. And the only way to deal with a dead person is you got to resurrect them. The covenant kills. And it kills immediately. So once you get divorced for a non-biblically based reason, that is, other than a reason for which God allows the covenant to be broken, God kills you, allows you to die on the spot, removes his hand from you, you're out there on your own, and just like in the Old Testament, when you remarry, if you go out and you remarry a person, you are committed adultery, so when you commit adultery, you're killed, physically in the Old Testament. Well, when you do that in the New Testament, you're killed spiritually. You die. And so that's the nature that's why Paul says, listen, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, listen to what he says. He says, don't you know, he's, he's arguing why you shouldn't live immorally, that a man who gets together with a prostitute becomes one flesh with her. He marries her. When a man sleeps with a prostitute, don't you understand, he says, that when he goes down in that bed with a prostitute, he gets married. Because marriage is one flesh. These two become one, illustrated in a sexual union. This is when you go with a prostitute, you get married. You say, I didn't know I was doing that. That's <laughs> what you're doing. You're committing the marriage vow, which is an illegitimate marriage vow. Therefore, it's death. It's death. And so what happens is God, in death, God removes his life from you. And when God removes his life from you, you exist, that's it. So some of us can never get our lives together no matter what we do because we've broken covenant. And the only way to solve that is to get back in covenant. Fourthly, here's a doozy. It includes ethical responsibilities that have a cause-effect relationship. You know what cause-effect is. Because of this cause, something will, have an eff something will be the outworking of it, and therefore it will be called the effect. Look at the cause-effect relationship in Malachi. Then we'll turn to Genesis, but look at Malachi. We're behind time, but I need to really get through this because it's critical. In Malachi, here's what we have. He says in verse 13, you keep coming, you're groaning, you're crying, because I don't accept your offering. But you want to know, why don't you accept our offering? Verse 14. Because the, the effect is you don't accept the offering. What's the cause? Because the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth. Verse 14. How, what is he saying? You know what he's saying? Because of how you treat your wife in divorcing her, if caused, the effect will be, listen, your worship is a waste of time. Your church attendance won't do you any good. You divorce your wife. Might as well stay home from church. Say, you've been crying asking me to bless you. You've been crying asking me to help you. You've been crying asking me to take care of you. And I say, I do not accept your offering. You say, you're going to give me more money. You're going to give me more time. I do not accept your offering. Why? Because I've been living in your home. I have not only watched you when you come to church, I watch you when you wake up. And I see how you dealt with your wife of your youth, how you've dealt treacherously, and for that reason, your efforts are canceled. That's heavy. You say, wait a minute, I hear what some of you are saying, you're saying, wait a minute, Pastor, wait a minute, that's that old hard Old Testament stuff. That's not for the New Testament, oh, isn't it? First Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Husbands, dwell with your wives according to knowledge, as with a weaker vessel. 
for she is a woman, and grant her honor as a joint heir, so that your prayers may not be stopped. Got that? You got that? God says, oh, you want to divorce your wife? Get up off your knees. You're divorcing your wife? Get up off your knees. I'm not listening to you today. You're mistreating your mate. Get up off your knees. We don't have anything to talk about. Don't ask me to answer your prayer. Don't ask me. You're misusing your mate. You're mistreating your mate. You want to divorce your mate. Don't tell me how spiritual you are. You have a lot of spiritual people who are messing up on their mates. That's not spirituality. God says you're dead. Dead people can't contact him. He says don't even bother to pray. Ladies, don't feel too comfortable. In the first six verses, he tells you the same thing. <laughs> same thing. Same thing. This stuff is hard because it's his covenant. And men have milk, taken his covenant and turned it into Milky Way. His covenant. Look at this in Genesis again real quick. Genesis chapter 2. Now look at this. Cause and effect. Remember verse 17. Of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Okay? So he says, this cause will bring this effect. <laughs> You're going to die if you do this thing, if you eat. But look at my man, my man, Satan. Look at He is cool, smooth. He comes in chapter 3, comes on, slithers on up to the lady, and says, verse 4, and the serpent said to her, you surely shall not die. You know what he's saying? You don't have to worry about the effect, even if you do produce the cause. If you do eat, don't worry about dying. God says, if you eat, you're going to die. Satan says, eat, you're not going to die. And he's been tricking a lot of folk for years. You, he's got folk believing you can break God's covenant and not die when the ne definition of covenant is death. So if you break God's covenant and you think you can just ease on up to a judge and say, no, yeah, we have a no-fault divorce here and um, we already agreed on the property and you say, I'm not going to die, you bitten the lie of Satan. And you wonder how come your life's still falling apart now that you're single again. You wonder how come you can't get rid of this depression? How come you can't stabilize your existence? How come you can't solidify your life even though this person's not in your life anymore? Because now God killed you. You say, but my husband is killing me. Now God's killing you. Because you die. See, the day you eat, you die. That's all it is. There isn't even any discussion about it. The day you eat, you die. You just die. God removes and separates himself from you in the area of fellowship. You die. So Satan wants to change the cause and effect. Finally, the last thing you need to know about the marriage covenant is that it is the means of transferring blessing. Covenants guarantee inheritance. Covenants guarantee the transfer of blessings. When you keep covenant, you transfer blessing. I was having devotions with my kids last night I was reading to them Deuteronomy 28, powerful chapter, divided into two halves. Here's how it goes. If you will be careful to do all the things that are in my word, then blessed shall ye be in the city, blessed shall ye be in the country, blessed shall the wife be in the kitchen. And then it goes on, blessed, 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 blessed. And then it gets to verse 15 and it says, but if you do not obey and are not careful to do all that is written in this book of the law, then he says, cursed shall ye be in the country. Cursed shall ye be in the city. And then he goes and he curses them. And he says, now it's up to you. Do you want blessings or do you want cursings? All right? Why? Because attached to God's covenant are God's blessings. If you're in the covenant, you get the blessings. If you're out of the covenant, you lose the blessings. And marriage is one of those covenants. So if you have a biblical basis for divorce, then you can get out of the covenant and still be blessed. If you have a non-biblical basis for the divorce, then God curses you for leaving the covenant. You say, wait a minute, that's Old Testament. No, no. Ephesians 6. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. And look at this. And it shall be 
well with you that you may live long upon the earth. He says if you obey covenant children and obey your parents, you have a quality of life and a quantity of life. So you know what I explained to my kids? I said the, the benefits that you kids have is because of the covenantal faithfulness of my father and my wife's father. You see, both of them are committed Christians and have been covenantally faithful in marriage. And so that was passed down to me so that if I made and my wife made the same spiritual commitment that my mother and father made, we get the benefits of their covenantal marriage relationship working in our family. So the kids living in our family get the benefits of our continued covenantal relationship with God. But I told them if they break covenant with God by not obeying their parents, then what they do is remove themselves from the blessing that is operating in this covenantal family so that they will have nothing to transfer to their family. And so the inheritance is cut off. And it does not continue. The beautiful thing about family, and the reason why getting our families together, look, let me show you what broken covenants do. You see them out here in the streets all day long. Children who were raised by children. The single parent problem has become an inheritance and becoming the perpetual lifestyle, and that is cursing. Blessing is when parents operate in covenant, children obey the covenant, then the blessings of the covenant are passed to the children so they can have that same blessing to pass to their children. So if one of my four children leaves the covenant, then they have no continuity of blessing. Only the three kids that stay in the covenant do. The other one dies unless he repents. So you say, what's the bottom line here, Pastor? Oh, very simple, verse 16 of Malachi. I hate divorce. You see, that hate is a strong word. I hate it. You know why he hates it? Because it's covenant issue. He hates divorce, not because you two aren't going to be living in the same house anymore. He hates divorce, not primarily because what we're going to do with the kids. He hates divorce, not primarily about how we're going to work out with the finances. He hates divorce because you have dealt treacherously with your wife, who is yours, by covenant. That's why he hates it. He hates it because you broke covenant with him regarding your wife. When you break covenant with him, he doesn't think that's a small thing. Just like you don't think it's small if somebody breaks a contract with you. God doesn't think it's small if you break covenant with him. I hate divorce, and you ought to hate it too, unless. And you still hate it, but in terms of following through on it, there is a biblical ground. I hate divorce. And so this church ought to do everything it can to fight against divorce, to stop it, to mediate it, to do whatever it can, because God says it stinks. Not primarily because of the kids. It stinks primarily because of the covenant. 